welcome to another sales pop uh, panel discussion and today I'm delighted with this subject because I think it's one of the most overlooked for some reason. We all know that we should use referrals and the referrals are a great source of, of uh, generating business. But for some reason, we either do it sporadically, we don't do it at all, or, or we do kind of a one and done and we sort of say, oh yeah, well, you know, I tried and there you go. So I have assembled today a fantastic panel um, and I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves rather than me read out bios because I think it's almost more interesting to hear from the people themselves. So first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome to the panel Joanne Black. Well, hi, John. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, I'm in San Francisco and referrals are my passion for the last 22 years. That's my business is working with sales teams so they actually have a methodology uh, for referral selling and get clients that way. Um, I'm in the Bay Area and what else do I want to say? Hmm. Well, it's foggy here today. We have a great life, more traffic than you'd like to know about, um, but that's my story, 22 years. Excellent, excellent. Yes, and uh, jo Joanne is a, a long-term expert in, in referral settings. We're delighted to have her. And joining us from uh, Florida is Bob Berg. How are you doing, Bob? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me with you. Uh, I'm author of a book called Endless Referrals, which came out in the, first in the 90s. It's now in its third revised edition. The last one came out in uh, 2005 or so. And uh, probably best known as co-author of a series of books, uh, the Go Giver series. And uh, just honored to be uh, with all of you today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great. And if you've never seen the Go Giver series, I would highly recommend that you go check them out. They're available on on SalesPop.net in the bookstore. A great series of books. And finally, Adrian Davis. How you doing, Adrian? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to our panel discussion. I'm the uh, president of a consulting company called Whetstone Inc., which helps organizations win, keep, and grow key accounts. And I'm also the author of Human to Human Selling. And as I said, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. I'm based in Toronto. Excellent. So we have, I'm in San John Gold, I'm in San Diego. We have San Diego, we got the Bay Area, we've got Florida, we got uh, Canada. So it's great. All right. So for those of you who are, uh, who are attending this uh, panel discussion today, if you have any questions, just stick them in the chat box and we'll get to it. Um, but I want to get straight into the conversation and and here's something I know that I've, I've discussed individually with some of you before, but I'll just start off with Joanne, though, is, you know, referral selling, it's, as I said at the very beginning, it still seems to be overlooked by many people and many people in sales. And I, I don't totally understand this. Do you, have a, do you have any good insight into why this may be so? How much time do you have, John? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely insight. So some sales leaders recently have said, I never thought about it. It's not even on their radar. And we wonder why. Many times they think that, well, I just have to go tell my salespeople to go ask for referrals and they'll do it. Well, that's not happening because they don't have a methodology, a system, a strategy. They don't realize that referral selling is a behavior change. It's a skill that needs to be developed. There needs to be accountability and reinforcement and coaching and all of that. So that is a huge reason why that they, they're not even aware, even though you can ask any salesperson, any sales leader, do you like to get referrals? And they, oh, it's my best source of leads, right? Mm -hmm. For everybody. And it happens. Look. A satisfied client goes to another company, they bring you in, it happens. But good salespeople don't sit back and wait. Right, right. No, it's a, it's an excellent point to, to start with. I think that's a, a really good one to take on board is the fact that it is a skill and methodology like everything else and it needs to be taught as such. Hey, Bob, in your experience, why do you think, why do you think it is that um, a lot of salespeople or sales leaders overlook referral, even though we, let's face it, we all pay lip service to it? 
Yeah, well, I agree with a lot of what Joanne said. I think she was right on the mark. Uh, you know, in many ways, I think people have a fear of asking for referrals, and that causes people to kind of put it out of their mind. It's easy to forget when it's something you don't want to do. And uh, I think in a sense, there's fear of rejection. You know, what if that person doesn't want to give me referrals or they say no? And, you know, we all hear when the, from sale, from our first sales 101 class, when they say no, they're not saying no to you, but to your idea. Yeah, that's fine and well, but it still feels lousy. <laughs> so it, it can be difficult in that way. Some people have a fear of talking past the sale, right? And, we, and of course, talking past the sale is never a good thing. Don't do that. But that should not be confused with professionally and effectively asking for referrals, as Joanne said, using a methodology and a systemized process. Uh, maybe they feel as though they're going to come across, and I've heard salespeople say this, they don't want to come across as needy by asking for referrals. Well, of course, we don't want to come across as needy, but that shouldn't, that has nothing to do with professionally and effectively asking for referrals, utilizing a proven methodology. They also may not know how to ask in a way that is effective. They've asked before, they've said, do you know anyone who, or who do you know? And the person said, well, I can't think of anybody right now, but when I do, I'll get back with you and they never do. So they say, okay, well, I don't know how to ask. So I just won't. And of course, that that's easy. That that one's the easiest because that's just a matter of the the how to. So I think for those reasons, there are fears of asking for referrals because let's face it, uh, as Joanne said, we, we we and I was Adrian teaches. We all know that it's so valuable that if someone didn't have those fears holding them back, they would do it. They would make it a part of their business process. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point because uh, I'm a bit like that with my to-do list that my wife gives me for fixing up stuff around the house. I I, I don't want to do it, so I tend to forget about it. Um, uh, Adrian, how about you? Anything to add on why you think salespeople are, are reluctant or sales managers are reluctant to, or overlook or ignore the whole Yeah, uh, I think the only thing I would add, I, I certainly agree with what I've heard so far. It resonated with me. What I would add, though, is that um, perhaps that fear that Bob spoke of, we would have to actually go a little further back, and that is around the delivery. That if I'm not confident around what I have delivered, if I do not, I'm not certain if my client is overjoyed, then I'm going to be reluctant to ask for referrals. So I think that uh, the commitment has to be before looking for referrals, we have to be committed to delivering value and, and delivering exceptional value and really delighting our customers. And once we've done that, the referral is automatic. And I think the confidence to ask for the referral will be there. Well, let's, uh, let's stick with you, Adrian, for a moment and let's move on to our, our second uh, question. So what is, uh, some people will say to you, and kind of Bob alluded to this, like what, what is the best time to ask for a referral or is there, is there a particularly good time? Yeah, and I think there is a best time to ask for a referral and that is after you have delivered value. I think any, any request prior to that, it may or may not be successful, but it certainly is premature. So I think we're, we're in this business to make a difference in people's lives. They're, they're trusting us to come in and have some impact on their operations and make a change for them. So I think we have to be committed to making that change first. Once we have truly delivered value that's, and the customer is delighted, that's the very natural. We, we may not even have to ask, uh, to be quite frank, John, if we really deliver exceptional value, I, I think customers will be looking out for us and trying to see who else can they uh, refer to us. And how about you, Joanne? Is there a good time? Well, there are good times. The best time to ask is when you've closed the deal. Now, somebody, some people say, well, no, I can't ask then. We'd better wait till we get our implementation team in here. And that, no, we can't do that. We better wait till we get results. And the problem is we're so far away from our buyer We've lost the momentum. Mm -hmm. So I say you need to ask every single person with whom you've come in contact during the sales process for a referral. Everyone, because everybody knows somebody. And we tend to discount people sometimes. And that happens especially when our solution is sophisticated. We think, oh, they wouldn't know anybody. You'd be surprised who people know. The challenge today around that is that it's the way many organizations are structured. So I'm an account executive, I close a deal, I hand it off to customer success, I move on. And I miss that opportunity 
to ask for referrals. And I do believe we have to ask. Clients will, from time to time, say, oh, you need to talk to so-and-so. And And that's great, but we get what we ask for. So if I want to meet Bob, or I want to meet Adrian, or I want to meet John, I'm going to ask my clients specifically for that person and get the introduction, because that's the definition of a referral. You need to be introduced. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely the best time when you close the deal. Now, um, when Adrian talked about value, absolutely important. So I believe there are other times during the sales process when you can ask. And the clue about value is a buyer will say, you know, I never thought of that. That's great insight. I can use that. I mean, basically, sometimes we've actually saved their jobs. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is at that point, we can ask as well. Yeah, no, listen, I, I think those are those are excellent points. And by the way, I love that uh, point that you raised about the fact that, I mean, most of us are involved in complex selling or more than one pe- person being involved mm-hmm. on the buying side. And you tend to think, OK, the final decision maker or whatever, that's the person to ask for the referral. But as you say, you've interacted with a bunch of other people who may have um, who may be able to refer you. What about you, Bob? Is there a good time? This is one of those few questions where I will have a definite answer, and that is, it depends. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) what I mean by that is it really depends on the context. It depends what you sell. It depends, is it a complex sale? Is it a one-time sale? Is it a, what, you know, and so it really kind of, I think what it really comes down to is when this other person knows you, likes you, and trusts you. At that point, there's a good chance that you've earned the right to be able to ask for referrals. And I really like that. I really like that earning the right. Really, really good insight. Thank you. Well, and that also, to your point, Bob, you know, what some people do is they hesitate. So how, how do I know that they know, like, and trust me? And I believe we know in our gut when we connect with people, you know, we connect with most people, but some people, maybe not so much, but we're, he- we're still hesitant to ask because we're not sure. So we need to go with our gut and ask. So, so Bob, just to elaborate on that, how do you, when you're doing it, how do you know that you've earned the right? I think like Joanne said, it, it's pretty much, you, you, can, you can pretty much sense the simpatico. Yeah. Uh, between yourself and the other person, which doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to be right, but that's part of life, right? We don't always know that. And if we do ask someone and we feel there's hesitation, and by the way, whenever we ask, we want to ask in such a way that we always give the person an out. We always let them off the hook so they don't feel as though there's pressure to do this. And when we ask in such a way like that, and we can tell there's any kind of hesitation, we need to be the one to step right in and make sure they know you know, that's okay. This may not be the right time. Why don't we wait until, or, or what have you again, depending upon the situation. So I think usually we're going to be able to tell, but if we, if we didn't get it right and we asked a little early, um, we need to be able to, to go own up to that, go with it and make sure that person feels relaxed with no pressure. Excellent. Okay. Um, the, the next question, and, and Joanne, let's start with you because you touched on this a moment ago. Um, you know, what does a good referral look like? Indeed, what is a what does a referral really look like? Because I think, as you as you said earlier, I mean, some people would say, "Well, I asked for a referral, and they kind of threw an email at me, or threw a name at me, or whatever, and sort of sent me on my way." So, what is it? What does a good referral really look like? Well, that means you've gotten an introduction. So, so here's how it goes. If, if I want you to, uh, you know, I want you to introduce me, right? And I do my research. I look on LinkedIn. I see who you're connected to. You and I, fortunately, have met each other in person. So uh, I don't know you know those people. So I need to have a, a chat with you about, do you know, Bob? Do you know Adrian? And if you do, I want to find out how you know them. And I get great intel, right? Mm-hmm. Because not everything's on our LinkedIn profile. I really want to find out from you about the person as much as I can. And then I'm going to ask you to introduce me. You see, we get what we ask for. So I want to ask for exactly what I want 
to the person and it's never, oh, do you know anyone, right? Because that is, that's the cop out because we're uncomfortable, as Bob said, uncomfortable asking for all those reasons. That is a good referral. However, there's one more thing. The best way is if John, I see you know George over at such and such company, then I'm gonna give you a valid business reason why George should talk to me. And then you're gonna reach out to George first and say, I'd like you to meet Joanne Black and here's why. A lot of people skip that step, but when you ask what's the best way, how does it work? That is the best practice. Excellent. And what about you, um, Adrian? What do you think in, in your world, what does a, a really good referral look like? And we might be operating in slightly different worlds. Uh, the world that I operate in is a lot of account management, complex solutions, uh, very high level stakeholders. And uh, we have to earn the right to ask for referrals. Uh, to, and, and there is this sort of old sales approach in this sort of the new world. In the world that I operate in, you have to be very careful if you come across as that sort of old school salesperson. So again, it's all about earning the right. What a lot of salespeople don't do, John, is follow through with the delivery of their value. And they do not uh, quantify the impact of their value. So it's at that point where you have delivered, you can quantify your value, you get validation from the client of the value that you've delivered. And they are certainly excited about the value that you've delivered, that that is the best time uh, in our world uh, to ask for a referral. And that referral is gonna be enthusiastic, it's gonna be emotional, it's gonna be heartfelt. And I think to Joanne's point, it's very important that the referrer reaches out to the person that they're going to refer us to and make that introduction for us and in a sense, pre-sell us uh, to, the, to the new prospect. I think that's, that's really critical. Uh, we need to be very clear on who our ideal customer is, right. what the ideal customer profile is, what the ideal customer looks like, and be able to communicate to our customers, this is the type of organization or this is the type of person that we want to do more business with. Do you know anybody like that? So I think it's that combination of earning the right by delivering into exceptional value, getting them in that moment when there's validation and emotional validation of the value that's been delivered, and then being very clear about what it is we're looking for, who it is we're looking for, and getting that introduction. Yeah, I think that's a good point because I think, um, I mean, how often have you heard a, a request for referral sound like, hey, Bob, do you know anybody who you think Pipeline or CRM would work for, as opposed to me doing some research? <laughs> so from your point of uh, as opposed to me actually doing some research and helping you identify who might be a good person in your network. So from your point of view, Bob, what does a really good referral look like? Yeah. So I think, again, it and I, and I love the points that both Joanne and Adrian made. They were spot on. Uh, I think we also need to look at the, um, uh, again, the context of the type of business it is. Because you may be in a business and typically not in a complex sale uh, situation in this type, but where you would be asking for referrals as opposed to knowing in advance who is in their world or who you would ask specifically for. That's a different type, and I want to get to that in a moment, mm -hmm. but it might be the type of person where you are asking. So I call that active passive because it's, it's active in that you're asking for the referrals, but it's passive in that. You're not asking for anyone particularly because you don't know who this person knows. But, um, you know, in, with regards to, to just saying, who do you know or do you know anyone who? And again, what's the answer you get? I can't think of anyone right now, but when I do, I'll call you or let you know. And that never happens because once they leave your site, as much as they might like you, they're not thinking about you anymore. Mm -hmm. And we haven't equipped them to be able to come up with names. Tom Hopkins in his classic, uh, How to Master the Art of Selling, he provided a, a methodology. He took just half a page to do this, but it was absolutely game-changing. And that's where he talks about gently funneling down people's worlds into small groups that they can see. So let's say you are, your client is, uh, is Anne, and you, might, and you know that Anne is an avid golfer. And you might ask, do you play with different people every time or, or the same foursome? She says, no, same foursome. We play together all the time. So I might ask, well, 
who do you play with? Who's in your foursome? And, and again, this is for a product that might be mm -hmm. generic enough that it could be. So again, it's context is important. And she might say, oh, uh, Harry Brown, Michael Cloud, Dr. Mary Ruart, the four of us have been golfing buddies for years. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now we can ask, hmm, would Harry or, or Michael or Dr. Mary, would any of them be, or however you would say it based on what you do, it might be all of them, none of them, one of them. Now we go to a different frame. We know she's a member of uh, her local NABO, National Association of Women Business Owners. They meet once a month. We don't say, is there anyone in NABO? It might be too big a group, but we might mm -hmm. say, is there anyone in your chapter who you sit next to every time or you're particularly good friends, maybe serve on a committee with? She says, oh, there's boom and boom or two. So what we're doing is we're creating the context for her to win, to be able to come up with names, which takes the pressure off her, takes the pressure off her memory. She's having fun with it now because she can, now we might go to a couple of other funnels we can also bring it back outwards and make it even more general once she starts to, okay? And then we can kind of pre-qualify those people. Remember, this is a person and knows us, likes us, trusts us. She wants to be a part of this. She loves the product. Uh, you know, as Adrian said, we, we have demonstrated value, right? We've earned the right to, and, and so, now, but now she's, she's coming along with you because she wants to. And uh, so now we might be able to, you know, why would you think that Harry would be, or, you know, what have you. Now, right. let's say there's someone who we want to, uh, someone in particular, and we want to, uh, to meet. Let's say there's a, a person who owns a big uh, 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 manufacturing firm, very wealthy guy. His name is uh, Thurston Howell the mm Eighth, -hmm. and, and we would like to get an introduction to Thurston Howell the Eighth. And let's take this local even off, off the internet. Let's take this local. We're, and this is a, a, he's a local person. And we, we just know we can provide value to him. Let's look up Mr. Howell, see where he's involved, what he's involved with locally. We see he's a member of his local um, uh, historical society, right, in, right. In, in town, the Springfield Historical Society. And so now we look at the roster online of the Springfield Historical Society, who's also a member John Thomas, who's a great friend of ours, and whether he does business with us or not, he maybe doesn't need what we do, but, but he's a great guy, a real center of influence, knows a lot of people. So now we make an appointment with John, and now we say, you know, uh, John, I believe you know Mr. Uh, Thurston Howell the Atheist. Oh, Thirsty, what a great guy, fantastic. <laughs> you never know, is it right? And so we might say something like, you know, I believe that through my, my services, I could bring a real lot of value to Mr. Howell's company, but I don't know him personally. I don't have a relationship with him. And I wonder if you feel it would be appropriate, because I always want to give the person an out for mm -hmm. them never to feel pressured. If you feel it would be appropriate, uh, if you might be willing to make a personal introduction for me. Boom. Mm -hmm. So now we've worked backwards. So that's now the active, active. We know who we want to meet and we actively ask for that person. Again, uh, context has a lot yeah. to do with, with how we do it. But I thought Joanne and Adrian, just what they said was just fantastic. Yeah. And I think this uh, and, and what you've done is great segue into the next question. And just before we go into it, I just wanted to ask Joanne, um, somebody asked a question here, uh, Trish, actually, um, you said to ask, for referral at the point of sales, she says that she sometimes finds clients who are reluctant to give a referral until they've received the value of whatever you've sold them. Well, yes, that can happen. But I've also asked at the point of sale and it's been fine because depending, if it's a complex sale and it takes time, you've developed phenomenal relationships and they trust you. And this is a key thing about a referral, that the trust that your prospect has for the person who's introducing you is transferred to us, it's transferred to you. So, and that's important, that's so often forgotten, they trust us to take care of their clients as they would. And that's huge. I just say, don't wait too long. Right. Because then you're too far away and then decide how are you going to stay in touch with those people until you have implemented your solution and they've gotten the results. So, um, from what Bob was saying, let's segue into, um, can you give, uh, starting with Joanne, can you give some practical kind of techniques for this, like what Bob was just outlining there with, with his technique? What are some practical techniques people can leverage to, to get referrals? 
Well, first, I want to um, push back a little bit, Bob, on what you said, is that I don't think we're pressuring people. I don't give people an out. If we know people, or let me preface that, when we know people well, they're glad to help us out. And the problem is that asking for help isn't so cool in our society. So that's part of the fear that comes in. But if I know someone well, and we all are a judge of that, it could be a client, it could be a colleague, it could be somebody from a business group, it doesn't matter. They really want to help and they're glad to, they just don't know what they're supposed to do. Sure. And so it's up to us to, to give them that valid business reason. Uh, what, what you talked about, Adrian, is having the results, the metrics that they can talk about, about typical results, and then align that to the problem that was solved. And that's where we come in with the problem. So what, is, what does this look like, how to ask? Well, first of all, we need to communicate the business impact of our solution. When I hear people say, I'll say to them, well, tell me, why do you want to talk to this person? And they'll say, well, you know, we've done some great things or we've been in business 25 years and we're professional and, and it, nobody cares about us. <laughs> and I encourage people to give an example, to tell a story about a client that had a similar problem, a very short story. What was the problem so that you relate here with them? That's number one, state the problem. And then just say working together and state the solution so that they can see, oh yeah, I have this problem. I could possibly get this same impact to my business. That is the way to bring someone in to help them understand who we're looking for, whether it's a client or someone else we know. That's great. And, and Adrian, how do you go about, like from a practical tech, a technique, how do you go about the referral process? I really do appreciate um, Bob's emphasis on context. So in the world that I operate in, it is, uh, you know, large accounts, organizations are penetrating these accounts. And so the referrals are often inside an account where mm -hmm. you know, we've gone in and we've worked to, with a particular business unit and we have been successful with that business unit. And then we've done our research and we understand who's in the other business units, what challenges they may have to, to Joanne's point, really focusing on the problem and the outcomes of our solutions and looking at those other adjacent business units that may benefit from a similar outcome. And then simply to make that plain to our current client that you know, this is the problem we've solved together. This is the impact that it's had on your business. These are two other business units that we're looking at that we believe you can do similar work for. You know, these are the, the heads of those departments. Can you tell me a little bit about them? Would you be willing to make an introduction? So it's really focusing, as Joanne said, on what is the problem that we solve? What is the outcome, the impact on the business? And then being very clear about who are the other business units that we believe are, are similar or looking for a similar outcome that we can benefit from and just making it very plain that uh, we, would, we would appreciate an introduction as well as a bit of background so that when we do actually connect with them, we have some, some personal context about them as well. And I also wanna just uh, reinforce uh, Joanne's uh, comment around telling a story, a very brief story that, that gets people to say, okay, this is what we do. So when you, when you, when you do receive that introduction, uh, one of the best ways for you to uh, contextualize what it is you do for this person is simply a story uh, where they hear the outcome that you've had on business unit A uh, and they can now see, wow, if you could do that for us, that, that certainly would be impactful. And that's the best way to kick off the, the new relationship. Yeah, it's, it's great what everybody has said, because I think what's coming through loud and clear, and I think this is probably one of the biggest takeaways, hopefully, for everybody here, is you have to do some work, right? A referral isn't, and, and I think what we've all, as I said, we've all probably been guilty of this in the past, of thinking that a referral is simply, as I said, do you know anybody who could use this, rather than strategically planning, doing my research, making sure I'm equipping the person. So it's a real process, right, Bob? I mean, you were outlining this earlier. So do you have a, 
anything else to add in terms of, of technique? Yeah, and I, I want to, if I may, just clarify something uh, based on what Joanne said earlier in terms of giving the out or back door. Uh, again, remember, everything is contextual, so it depends on the situation. And when I said that about uh, asking about the person introducing me to Mr. Howell, uh, remember that person's not something, someone who has done business with me before. And when you, at, when you provide a back door, it's not a sign of weakness. It's not because you don't have confidence in yourself or in your value. Uh, when you provide someone with a back door, it's really, it's a mental escape route, which makes them more comfortable as opposed to feeling as though there's pressure for them to do it. So, you know, what I call Berg's law of the out or back door is that the bigger the out or back door you give someone to take, the less they'll feel the need to take it. And I, you know, I find that to be just a, a um, you know, a respectful and very effective thing to do. Uh, when I was talking earlier, I think when I said, uh, when the question was, how do you know if you really have that no like, and trust mm -hmm. and you have that feeling about it and you ask that person and then I said, but if that person's resistant, now you come in right away and give the out and give the back door. So they don't feel as though, well, they're a little resistant. So now you're coming in and pressuring. I kind of find that would be counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish. But I absolutely agree with her that we certainly need to have confidence in ourselves and confidence that we're bringing immense value to them and to the people they refer us to. But I'd say uh, the back door is more something uh, out of strength than out of a feeling of, of lack of confidence. Yeah, John, may I comment a minute? Sure. Um, I like what you said about the bigger the back door, then they don't take it. Um, but I also have seen that people refer us, not our business. So people are new all the time, right? And they say, well, you know, I've only been with this company two months. How would I get a referral? We get a referral because they know and like and trust you. And they're confident, again, that you will take care of their colleague or their client or their friend as they would. And so that's the reason that people refer us not necessarily because they know our business, then it's up to us to clarify the reason. Yeah, I think that's a really great point there, Joanne, that they're confident because nobody wants to insert someone else in someone's life that's going to be a problem for them. You know, so they want to make sure that if they're going to refer us, that they actually feel confident that we're going to do great work for them. Great point. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And I think that goes across, um, you know, everything. It's like when somebody asks you to be a, a referral for them for a job. I mean, you're not going to refer that person, even if you've worked with them, even if you kind of like them. But if you don't trust them and you don't think they do a good job, uh, you know, you're going to be. Um, so um, what I'd like to do now, maybe start with you, Adrian, is... Um, give some examples, and you don't have to name the companies, just kind of just broad examples of where you have seen a, a good referral process transform a business. Yeah, one comes to mind, it's actually a client that I'm just recently re doing some work with again. But uh, this is an organization that has built their business up to a multi-million dollar business. And uh, they do what's, what's interesting about this business, John, is they do project work. Mm -hmm. and, and once they've done a project, and the project could be anywhere from $20,000 to $2 million, but, but once they've done a project, that's it. Mm -hmm. and, and the client is unlikely, they're, they're, they're in, involved in environmental assessment, but the client is unlikely to need their services again for another 10 years, maybe never again. So it's very, they, they have to go out and hunt new projects all the time. And I think one of the big insights that I was able to bring to them was that their client, so they have customers, but their client is actually not the person who cuts the check to them. Their client are the lawyers, the commercial real estate agents, the banks, the, the uh, mortgage uh, brokers who are working with the customer and can refer the customer when they see, oh, you're, you're going to need an assessment here. They can refer the customer to someone who they know will take really good care of them. And so in that case, what, we're, what we've done is built out a process, a disciplined process, where they now know how to engage these referral sources in a much more effective, much more strategic, much more methodical way. And as I say, they've, they've built this company into a multi-million dollar business, and it, it continues to grow and thrive 
and, and just this recognition that this business really is built upon referrals and the projects will come as long as we take really good care of our referral sources. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic, Adrian. And I like that idea about actually identifying who the the, the buyers really are or who are the people who really influence the purchase, because I think that's something that's often overlooked. And you know, John, I'll just, sorry, I'll just add one, one thing uh, on this. What's, what's key in all of this is my client does great work. They do phenomenal work. But the, the customer who cuts the check really is not in that position to come back to them and do additional work and may not know anybody who needs their services right then and there. And so the key, though, is that they do great work. And now they can work with these other referral sources who do right. have a steady stream of work for them. Yeah, so so like the attorneys, like the commercial real estate uh, um, mortgage brokers, all of that, they they work with multiple people. The actual client who cuts the check needs it once. Um, how about you, Bob? Where have you seen companies transform themselves through really good strategic referral processes? Well, I think it it really begins with a uh, with a culture, uh, a referral culture, and I've been brought into companies really to just just kind of helped bring that culture to them. They weren't getting the buy-in for it. Again, it was, yes, referrals are a good thing. Okay, yeah, I mean, we know referrals. It's easier to set the appointment with, with a referred prospect. Price is less of an issue. With a referral, it's easier to complete the transaction. With a referral-based prospect, uh, they're already of the mindset that that's how you work, so they're more likely to refer you to others and all that's great. Again, people know it on an intellectual level, but they're not able to get their people to buy in. So, you know, when I go in, the first thing I want to do is just get them, get that mindset changed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And once we do that now, you know, you, you see, now you see the results and it's not from anything that I do as much as they being able to embrace the fact that, yes, this is worth getting past those fears and taking on this, uh, this new approach. And, you know, I've had people work their way up from you know, uh, a beginning salesperson to a state sales coordinator because they were able to do it off of a referrals. And not only did they build their their business that way, but when they were recruiting their team, it was the same thing. So, you know, I mean, I think it's it's one of those things where a, a culture can be transformed when they understand that referrals and a referral system, as Joanne said, a referral mindset, if you will, uh, is actually part of the very way you're doing business, the culture itself. Yeah, excellent. And just quickly, Bob, um, when you go, say you go to change culture, what are some of the obstacles that you face? Like, where where does the pushback come from? Oh, well, it's, well, it, there's two. One, it's the fear of the salesperson, okay, mm -hmm. for the reasons we discussed earlier. But it's also the the, the leadership or management Again, understanding on an intellectual level why it's important, but not willing to measure, not willing to 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 coach, not willing. You know, I can go in and do a program. That's fine. They're going to know how to do it, and I can equip the leadership to be able to to uh, to measure to to. But they've got to do it, mm -hmm. and it's not a matter of just saying, "Okay, you learned what to do. Now go get it." They have got to rehearse it. They've got to practice it. They've got to become comfortable with it. They've got to actually absolutely begin living this. And not in a way that they're putting pressure or making quotas or no, nothing like that. It's just understanding that it is beneficial to the organization, but it's really beneficial to those people that you're working with, to your customers and clients, because you're able to work with them and give them much more of yourself. Uh, in this case, when you're working through that sort of business. Excellent. And, and Joanne, what are some examples? Uh, um, you've worked with, a, obviously, this is, your, this is your area and you've worked with a lot of companies. Where have you seen companies transform and, and how have they manifested that transformation? I've heard referral culture come up from several clients recently. I really hadn't had, heard that word before. And I have one client now, they want to build a referral culture. And as you know, culture doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, one definition that I like uh, is culture is what happens when no one's looking. Right. I so how do you, right? How do you get people to live and breathe referrals? So when I talk to clients, this kind of freaks them out. <laughs> 
because I say referrals need to be your number one outbound prospecting approach, outbound. Mm -hmm. So it freaks them out because they think, oh, that's all I can do. Well, it's not all, right? You still have your websites, your blogs, your social media, your marketing, your everything. And they probably still have a group that's cold calling, all right? We're not going to erase that from this earth. But when referrals become the priority of the leader, that's when you start to see some change. And that's when with the sales leader, when I work together, which I'm doing now, is creating the referral strategy, which means, you know, what are you going to do? What's the outcome you want? How are you going to measure people? Who should be involved? Where do we start? Uh, all of that needs to happen first. We need to set metrics. And then we need to build the skills because when people build skills and they practice and they're coached, they get comfortable and confident with asking. And that's when that fear goes away. And Bob, you mentioned that that fear is so real. You know, we can give people the skills we can talk to, we're blue in the face, but, but they're still going to be uncomfortable until they practice over and over and they ask and they realize, yeah, I'm still alive, it's fine. <laughs> and they actually get results they didn't expect. So you take a core group that raises their hand and says, I'm willing to be accountable for results, to be coached, and to have metrics set, which they help set, and that's the group to start with. That is the beginning of a referral culture. Because then everybody in a company, aside from salespeople, knows people, right? In one instance, a client I was working with, they started a commercial division of a bank in downtown San Francisco. Well, it's not storefront, it's up like on the seventh floor. And the sales leader explained the referrals who they were looking for, who would be an ideal client. The first referral came from the 23-year-old receptionist. Mm -hmm. Why? His roommate's parents were the perfect referral, and they became bank customers. We don't know who people know, and everyone in a company can refer. That's where we're going in establishing a referral culture. I really like this term, John, uh, Joanne, as well, of the referral culture. And what I would say is that the basis of a referral culture is an outcome culture. That when we can get the whole organization committed to delivering outcomes, then the, the building a referral culture and the confidence to have that referral culture is a natural outgrowth. And I'm thinking of a client that I have out west out in Saskatoon that has, it's just a wonder to see this company. Every time I talk to them, they've just won the, the largest deal in the company's history. Uh, it's quite phenomenal. And, and what's, what I see there is the VP of sales and the president, who are both owners of the company, uh, they have such a great uh, synergy between them, and they've built this culture in the organization of being committed to outcomes. One of the first questions they ask when they meet, and what I, what I did in my work with them is help them to raise the level of engagement of who they are talking to. So they're now selling consistently into the C-suite. And one of the first questions they ask when, when they, or first type of conversation they have when they're meeting with these C-level executives is, what is the outcome you are looking for? Where do you need to take your organization? And then once they're engaged, the whole organization is committed to delivering that outcome, to getting the client to that, across that finish line. And because they do this, and it's just become a part of that, they, they truly have an outcome culture. Asking for referrals is so easy to them. Everybody has this natural confidence. That they have an ease with it because they, they know that they've earned the right and they know that they're going to do well by anybody who comes into their path. And they know that they're going to make their referrer look great. And so I think this, this uh, notion of a referral culture is a fantastic notion what precedes it is a commitment to an outcome culture. And I think the VP of sales, who is not committed, and I, I, you know, in my history, my background, I've had some of these VPs of sales where they're so committed to chasing the dollar mm -hmm. and they're not, they're not committed to delivering outcomes. They become a nuisance and their whole team becomes a nuisance to society. <laughs> uh, you know, what we need is this, this, 
focus, this laser focus on creating value, on delivering outcomes, and then it's just natural that we'll want that people will want to refer us, and it'll be natural for us to ask for referrals. And this client as well, just to finish here. Uh, not only are they so confident asking for referrals, they are confident in asking their customers to help them close business because uh, they just know that they deliver, they deliver, they deliver. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, a, that's a great uh, that's a great further step, I think, that idea of a customer not just referring you but helping you close business. Sorry, Bob, go ahead. Uh, no, my, my apologies. Uh, so I want to just pick up on, on Adrian's point when he talks about the outcome focus. It always starts from there. So I, I think that Joanne and I, where our specialty has been a little bit more in the referral aspect, um, we're assuming that, of course, the value is immense. <laughs> okay, so I love what Adrian said. That's, that's got to be where it starts. Because if you're if you have a, a company doing a lousy work, all the referrals in the world are just going to make you go out of business quicker. Okay, <laughs> so so it always always starts with immense value. That's why we say and we say this in, in the Go Giver that money is simply an echo of value. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the thunder, the value's lightning. The focus must be on the value. Okay uh start with that okay and pleasing just i mean just immensely pleasing and overwhelming with great value okay now here's where where i think adrian's a lot more confident than i am and i <laughs> admire this i don't see that I, I see that a lot of times when you do a bang up job a wonderful job you will get referrals sometimes without asking or that it will be natural for the people just to ask i I don't see that happening as much as what Adrian has experienced. Um, I see a lot of people doing wonderful, fantastic work, and they don't feel comfortable asking for referrals. Or, you know, you think of the person who does a great job, a fantastic job, and they, ne they don't receive referrals, and it's not because the person doesn't love them who they help. Mm -hmm. It's that that person just hasn't thought of it. Mm -hmm. because it's not in there so i don't think it's an either or i think it's an and right you know we do great work and we also have an active um uh methodology for you know for asking for referrals if they're not just uh provided but i also want to say i agree very much with something adrian said too that when you've really got someone you've done great work for who knows you who loves you who trusts you they will be your advocate or what we call your personal walking ambassador. Mm -hmm. And that just, of course, works out wonderfully. But yes, it always starts with the outcome uh, focus. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and that point as well, though, I think that it shouldn't be overlooked is um, you may do great work for me. The outcome may be fantastic. And in that moment, I may think, ah, oh, these guys are great. I, you know, I should tell other people about it. But then life gets in the way yeah, gets and the business way, right? gets in the way. <laughs> and if you don't remind me and prompt me, I'm probably never going to do it, right? I mean, I'm not going to suddenly remember one day, oh, yeah, I remember, Bob, I should do that. You know, you need to prompt. Uh, so I think that... To, you know, we need to take him, take the, the situations yeah. individually. And, yeah. and, you know, it's always a, it always goes back to context, I guess, right? In, yeah. the, in the unique situation. Yeah. But as I always say, I mean, you shouldn't... Don't outsource your result to fate, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <In other words. laughs> and uh, Joanne, just in the last few moments we have here, um, what is... What is one piece of advice if somebody is listening here today what is one thing that they could just do today if maybe there's not a referral culture maybe they don't have a methodology all that maybe there's a lot of work they need to do but what is the what is one thing they could start with today look at where they have the best relationships and you know the clients are always our best source obviously when we've done great work and people aren't consistently asking you know, when I say, have you asked every single one of the people you've come in contact, et cetera, et cetera, nobody says yes. So you always go where the relationship is. And it may not be your senior buyer. It could be. It could be anyone in the organization where you've just clicked and you know it. That's a person you can ask and be specific. But you need to write down the names because unless, unless we write it down, it's not going to happen. 
Mm -hmm. no, ex ab absolutely great point. I think the good takeaway there is look at everybody you've done business with and look at all of the people you talk to during that, tra during that uh, sales process and ask them. Um, how about you, Adrian? What's one thing that people could do today? I think just start with the question, what would I have to do to really delight this customer? What is the outcome I would have to deliver for this customer to be really excited about my services? And then focus on delivering that and then have that discipline to go back and to measure the, the impact that you, you've made. And in that moment, that's the best time. I'm not saying it's the only time, that's the best time to ask for a referral. Excellent. And you, Bob, what is one thing our listeners or viewers could do today? I, I, when you ask that question, I think of a, a very wise mentor many, many years ago who said to me, Berg, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target is serving others. When you hit the target, he said, you'll get a reward. And that reward will come in the form of money. And you can do with that money whatever you choose. But never forget, he said, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It ain't the target itself. Your target is serving others. And I think if we can work with that in mind, that our target is serving those who have entrusted us to serve them, I think we're on the right track. That's great advice. Excellent. Well, listen, this has been a phenomenal panel. I mean, I think we could talk for another hour, probably more um, <laughs> as we go deeper. But again, I'd like to thank Joanne Black, Bob Berg and Adrian Davis for joining us today. Um, for those of you who joined us live and for those of you who are going to watch the recording later on, I really, really would uh, encourage you to uh, look at each of these individual people and find out more about them. You'll find the links uh, here. But also, I think it came out of today is have a referral culture. And I think that's the big takeaway is really have a referral culture. Obviously, as Adrian said, deliver the value and be great at what you do and delight your customers. But if that's if you're already doing that, then develop a referral culture and train your people how to do it and realize uh, referrals can come from any anywhere. I love that idea about the, the reception as being the one to bring the first uh, big customer. So thanks, Joanne. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Adrian. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much. And thanks for everybody who joined us. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another panel discussion very soon. Thank you.